Afternoon everyone. Welcome to this meeting of St Helens Council Cabinet. Uh, just before we begin the formal agenda of today's meeting, I'd like to address an issue that's in the news at the moment. Uh, events in America have brought issues of racism and injustice, and in particular the Black Lives Matter movement to the front of all our minds. The fight for equality and social justice matters just as much here in St Helens Borough as it does anywhere else. Black communities here in the UK disproportionately suffer from inequality whether it's in health, housing or education, and this can't continue. The White Lives Matter banner which flew over the Etihad Stadium on Monday was grossly offensive because it twists and diminishes what is a genuine and necessary call for support from the black community. Black Lives Matter doesn't mean that only black lives matter or that black lives matter more, just that black lives matter and that the injustice and inequality black people still experience is unacceptable. It's up to all of us to play our part in fighting racism, prejudice and injustice. We have to try to listen, learn and to act. As leader, I'm determined that St Helens Borough Council will play its part. Now, for some years, we've led the No Place for Hate and Better Than That campaigns, and I encourage all residents to take the pledge and read more about the difference we can each make at safeststhelens.org.uk. And now I'd like to ask cabinet colleagues and officers present, as well as members of the public watching today's meeting, to pause and reflect for a moment on this issue, to remember all those whose lives have been lost or damaged by racism, and to think about what we can each do to make a positive change. Thanks everybody. Okay, we'll begin the formal part of today's meeting then. Item number one is apologies for absence. I haven't received any. Two is minutes of the meeting held on the 27th of May 2020. Are they agreed? Agreed. 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 Three is declarations of interest from members. And four is revenue and capital outturn report 1920. Councillor Bond. Thanks, Chair. Firstly, I'd like to join with the leader in what he said about Black Lives Matter. I want to say a few things myself. I am the spouse of a BAME woman, the father of two BAME kids. I don't believe it's too much to expect that my family's lives matter as much as anyone else in our society. The far right and their fellow travellers have, of course, tried to divert attention away from the real message of Black Lives Matter, a simple message of equality of opportunity, dignity, respect and freedom for all. Their aim is to impute a strand into the campaign which simply isn't there and to undermine the effectiveness of the message. For the UK, the legacy of empire seen through the eyes of the oppressed and subjugated is uncomfortable. Collective memory exists in those communities that were suppressed. Such discomfort should not though get in the way of the truth. Black Lives Matter doesn't seek to lessen the value and worth of white lives. It's about levelling up in the real sense of the phrase, not the lip service that the Tories pay to it. And the suffragettes, including my great grandmother from Haydock, campaigned for votes for women. They weren't campaigning to take votes away from men. They weren't campaigning to downgrade male votes. And they weren't campaigning to place themselves above men in the system. They were campaigning for equal treatment. Black Lives Matter is no different. The campaign does not seek to downgrade the inherent dignity of each person in society. It seeks to ensure that we are all afforded the same dignity, respect and life chances as everyone else. Black Lives Matter to me. So moving on to the agenda item, um, in today's cabinet meeting there are three finance papers stretching almost to 100 pages in total. Um, I would normally deal with each succinctly as a significant detail in each report, but we like the rest of local government face significant funding issues. 
I stated some months ago that long-term funding of adult social care and children's services in the absence of central government planning presented a potential exist existential threat to local government. Local government is now stirring a real existential threat squarely in the eye. The impact of COVID-19 on local authority finances to date, the response from central government and the ongoing uncertainty in funding has created a deeply worrying picture for our local government of whatever political strife across town and county halls in every corner of the country. Two of the three reports before Cabinet are part of the normal cycle of financial reporting. At July Cabinet, we were due to receive reports on the revenue and capital outturn from the last financial year and the first quarterly monitoring report for the present one. Additionally, due to the times we live in, there is a specific report on the effects of COVID-19, the Council's response to the crisis and the predicted financial impacts. The outturn report details positions for the revenue and capital, along with an update on the reserves and balances position at the end of March. Details of the Council's Treasury management activities for the year are also provided. In the revenue section, section one of the report, it shows that during the year a forecast overspend was regularly reported against the approved budget and Cabinet agreed a number of actions to be taken to address the budget pressures. The final net position is a variation of 5.5 million against the approved budget. Annex A of the report provides details of portfolio variances of 9.1 million, which have been offset by council wide variations of 3.6, thus summarising Annex B. At section two, the report on capital, table three summarises the capital spend on assets during the year. Variations against the previous forecast are mainly due to a number of schemes being rephased and planned works being programmed for 2020 2021, which is entirely usual. Annex C summarises the capital programme and Annex D provides details of schemes reprofiled into this year and schemes accelerated into this year from last year. Section 3 shows the reserves and balances position. Table 5 shows the impact of the revenue outturn position on the Council's general fund balance. If the carry forwards previously referred to are approved, the balance is available at just under 9 million, which is an improved position from that previously forecast. Table 6 details the outturn position with regard to earmark reserves at the end of March, with Annex E providing further details. I need to caution Cabinet colleagues that there are approvals for the use of some of the earmark reserves beyond March 2020, and period one of the financial monitoring reports elsewhere on the agenda details those approvals. The position for school balances and capital receipts is provided at tables seven and eight. The COVID-19 emergency grant funding received in March has been earmarked into a new reserve for utilisation during 2020-2021 and the creation of a new reserve is proposed to support any one-off additional costs from service reviews and structures in continuing to deliver the Council's ongoing modernisation programme. Of the three reports, this one is the least impacted by COVID-19, but all three need to be considered in light of the others. So on that note, I'll move the report. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Are there any questions or comments? Are the recommendations on page eight agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you, everyone. Item five is financial monitoring report period one, 2020-21. I'll just let Councillor Bond take a quick uh, sip of water. Yes. <laughs> and back to you, Martin. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Now, this is the monitoring report for the first quarter of this financial year. Um, and it, it's it, it's presented as a business as usual um, report on the assumption that the government will cover the, the, the cost of, of COVID-19, but we'll come back to that in the final paper. So it shows a variance against budget of, of 0 0.6 million. Um, and those reported budget pressures are within adult social care and health and protecting young people's portfolios. They've been mitigated to some extent by favourable forecasted variances against budget in other portfolios. Um, Cabinet will recall that the approved budget for this year recognised the increased demand-led pressures, particularly in social care, and pressures in some income generating areas. And consequently, a number of baseline budgets were reset as part of that process. Based on the current forecast, the projected general fund balances will be in the region of 8.4 million at the end of the financial year. But again, this is caveated against the fact that central government should pick up the cost of our financial exposure to COVID-19. But again, we'll say more about that later. Section two of the report 
deals with the implementation of saving proposals for this year that we dealt with last year. Uh, as part of the present budget, in addition to a five million contribution from reserves, colleagues will recall the decision to make portfolio savings of five million to arrive at a balanced budget position. In some areas, the impact of COVID-19 on delivering these savings is, um, is being experienced. It's currently forecast that 1.4 million of agreed savings will not be achieved as a consequence of the pandemic. A further 0.7 million is at risk of not being delivered if plans cannot be implemented during the reset and recovery period. However, almost 58% of the savings are expected to be achieved. Um, Section 3 deals with the capital programme and reflects the post outturn from last year and the impact of slippage stroke acceleration of schemes from last year. Section 4 deals with reserves and balances. Um, the Council's position with regard to EMAC balances at the end of the year is provided at section 4.2 and Annex C provides further detail through to the end of 2022-2023. Now the utilisation of EMAC balances during this financial year reflects a reprofiling of funding from last year and that's detailed in the October report and I mentioned that previously. The Council's position with regard to capital receipts are detailed in the report. Section 5 deals with the financial monitoring issues. And section six for treasury management. What I would say the, of note would be we need to note the uh, the decision of the Secretary of State to call in the Parkside Link Road, along with various other um, planning decisions that have been made in the area. Um, so I've no more to say about that particular report. It's factual. It deals with the position, uh, and I move the report. Thanks, Martin. Um, is any questions or comments for Councillor Bond on that report? No. Okay, can we agree the recommendations then on page 50? Agreed. 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 Thanks everyone. Uh, item six then is COVID-19 financial impact report. Councillor Bond. Thank you. So this is the COVID section of the, of, 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 uh, of the papers today. And it's one of the most significant papers to come before cabinet in recent times, I believe. The whole world in the midst of a global pandemic on an unprecedented scale in modern times. And the impact of the virus on our way of life has been akin to wartime conditions. <coughs> now, the role of local authorities has been fundamental in protecting the most vulnerable, actioning central government plans in their business support schemes and in so many other ways. And I'm really proud of the way that this authority and the people of the borough have reacted. They pull together in partnership with our superlative borough-wide voluntary sector and continue to show the sort of common purpose and endeavour that we'll see us through. The officers and staff of this authority have shown that they are committed public servants, adaptable, compassionate and resilient. And I want to thank them for their amazing work since the 20th of March and for what is yet to come. However, what has been the cost of this? How has it been funded? And what about the funding gap that it's created? Well, the report analyses these questions. The latest central government buzzword for financial reporting is granular detail, and we've provided granular detail to governments about what we've spent and where our income pressures are. This report, taken alongside the other two, provides the detail and its grim reading, particularly when at the outset the government told us to do whatever it takes. Now, in this authority, we know how this government operates, and we are rightly wary of this silver tongue promise. As could have been predicted, this has proven to be an unreliable promise. The report acknowledges the extra funding supplied by government thus far, and that has to be acknowledged. It explains the background to the Council's response to the current pandemic, which includes providing support to the most vulnerable, supporting organisations, groups and businesses, and ensuring residents receive the essentials they need. All this in conjunction with partners and the communities. The government has so far provided funding in two tranches, 6.39 million in the first tranche and 4.97 million in the second tranche, a total of 11.36 million. The reduction in allocation for St Helens in the second tranche of 1.42 million, which is a reduction of 22%, was due to changes in the allocation methodology, with £260 million being added to the funds for 260 mainly district councils, with this being reduced from other authorities' allocations. The Metropolitan Borough has suffered heavily in this, in this reallocation. Government has also requested granular data to be returned to them, quantifying the value of financial pressures that local authorities face as a result of the pandemic. Two data returns have been completed, with the latest completed in June on the basis of a lockdown until July, estimating the financial pressures of 29.5 million. 
However, the ongoing cost of the council is likely to be higher than this, and an estimate of the financial impact based on a six month time frame produced for the city region estimated financial pressures of 36 million, which are broken down in the report. Other funding has been received by local authorities from government for specific initiatives, and these schemes and allocations are detailed in section 3.8. Based upon the existing level of funding provided by government, the council faces unfunded pressures of £24.64 million. Pounds. Now, government has been lobbied to ensure the necessary funding is provided to all councils. The leader has written on a number of occasions. However, instead of seeking to address all of the financial pressures that councils face, the narrative from government has changed from the position of whatever it takes to get the nation through to the position set out in a letter from the Director of Local Government Finance on the 28th of May that states that the funding provided to government is enough to cover the cost of activities councils have been asked to deliver. The letter then lists the functions the funding is to cover and makes no mention whatsoever of funding for income pressures. Now the council has and will continue to lobby government about the need for additional funding. This lobbying is being undertaken by other authorities, as well as a number of other bodies, including the City Region, the LGA, the Association of Directors of Social Services and the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives. The uncertainty that exists regarding the quantum of funding to be received, as well as the ultimate cost of St Helens from the current pandemic, means that Cabinet needs to consider the progression of an emergency budget during this financial year, aligned with the reset and recovery phase of the Council's COVID-19 response, with all services included for review. A real problem is the opaque manner in which central governments have so far allocated funding. The second tranche being based apparently on population and not need. The Institute of Fiscal Studies reported on Monday that local authorities with higher levels of deprivation have residents who appear more vulnerable to the coronavirus on a number of dimensions, potentially increasing service demands and challenges. Mental ill health, homelessness and overcrowding, interventions from children's social services and receipts of free school meals are higher in local authorities with higher levels of more general deprivation. If, as evidence suggests, Households already facing challenges and poverty are more vulnerable to the stresses and strains of lockdown and social distancing. The demand for support from local authorities and other public services could increase. So the final actual implications for local authorities what magically disappeared after the 4th of July when the pubs open. The LGA estimates that the funding gap to the end of the year across local government is £6 billion. Last Monday, Simon Clark, the Minister of State at MHCLG, stated that government was working on a comprehensive plan to ensure financial sustainability for councils this financial year. This needs to come sooner rather than later. Plus, a return to austerity for councils like ours that have borne the brunt of that wicked policy since 2010 would wreak even more damage to our communities. The detail of the impact of COVID across the city region is stark in the report. The Minister of State has indicated a return to austerity won't happen, but will be forgiven for not taking this government at face value. So to conclude, Chair, Cabinet needs to note the report, the impact across LCR and consider progressing an emergency budget for the rest of this financial year. This should be aligned with the reset and recovery phase of the Council's COVID-19 response, with all services included for review. I move the report. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Uh, Kath Fogarty, I think, is coming in. Just to say a few words now. Kath? Apologies. Just having some technical uh, difficulties. Bear with us. We'll come back to you, Kat, if you can hear me. Don't worry, we'll come back to you. These things happen. Okay, um, I'd just like to start before I open up to questions and comments from members. Um, I'd just like to to start by thanking our outstanding council staff uh, who've done amazing work in, in recent months and in the last 10 years as well when we look at the big picture uh, 10 years of austerity has been extremely tough to say the least for our uh, our council and for the essential services 
uh, and the key workers who provide them. But thanks to our staff, thanks to residents, local businesses and charities, we're still standing. We are resilient in St Helens, but COVID is a challenge like none, uh, none that we've faced before. Uh, Martin's right I, when he mentioned I've written letters to government. I've written three letters, um, three times to government uh, regarding local government funding specifically. On the 17th of April, I wrote to the Prime Minister. On the 30th of April, I wrote a joint letter with all St Helens group leaders, including the leader, of the, the leader of the Conservative group. And I also wrote to the Business Secretary on the 23rd of April regarding uh, Raise the Bar campaign, asking him to consider increasing the threshold for business grants to help those with a rateable value of between 51 and 150,000. I've also written alongside city region partners, including Metro Mer, Steve Rotherham. Our council and the city region have had no response at all to any of these letters, and some of them written two months ago, as I said. Ignoring the challenges faced by essential services and the key workers who provide them and ignoring requests for support for those services is not a good look for the government. Boris Johnson can and no doubt will repeat the 3.2 billion line again and again, but the fact is it isn't enough. St Helens faces a £25 million funding gap after taking into account the extra funding so far given to us. If it isn't covered, this will have a catastrophic long-term impact on the essential services our residents need and expect. All we're asking for is fur funding for the key workers that we clapped every Thursday night for 10 weeks. We can't turn our backs on them. We can't go back to how things were, with carers and public sector staff underpaid and overworked. We've got a unique opportunity to reshape our economy and the way we do things. And we've got to start by properly funding and rewarding those services which we've all seen in recent months are truly vital to our society and to our way of life and everything we value. So with that, I'll open up to comments and questions from members. Councillor Quinn. Yeah, um, first of all, I'd like to endorse everything that Councillor Bond said about our staff, our management and our public out there um, who have all been tremendous over the last 12, 14 weeks uh, on working under great pressure and unprecedented um, demand for the services. Uh, Councillor Bond goes on to explain the finances and the pressures that are there. Yet St Helens was under pressure prior to any money coming from the government for COVID. And we had sent a motion, 100% endorsed by all parties, asking for more money. We got a reply to that, and that was social care. Uh, I've got so much money and you've got a 2% levy that we can charge our public. Well, that's not government giving it us. That is our public who are already struggling, having to pay more. Mm. So that to me is an insult to our public and to the general public within our country. When they say that, that does not resolve the issue that Councillor Bond has said has been with us for 10 years austerity. More importantly, the way local authorities are funded. So 10 years of austerity, it's really, it, it's St Helens hard. It was 90 million. It's going to be more than that by the time we've finished. So everything that Councillor Bond has said is correct. But unless our government fully understands the areas that are different from uh, the leafy areas within the, within the country, we've got illnesses that are a legacy of, of our industrial heritage there. And the multiple illnesses, they're very costly. So they need to look at the history and the illnesses and disabilities of our communities. They paid the whack in those days when the mines was open, when the glass factories was here, they paid the taxes. 
and yet they are the people now that are struggling and are being asked to pay more from the little money they get. So I would endorse everything Councillor Bond said. I would also say to our public or ask our public, please read everything from every area that this council operates, be it social care for adults, children, environment, our community safety, our public health, just look at all the services that have been provided and we've continued to do that. We don't know whether the money is going to come forward now, but that is why we need that, uh, that emergency budget. And it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough for us all because we've got a government that doesn't keep its word, certainly doesn't keep its word and can't rely upon them. So I am concerned about the future. I know we've got excellent officers that will do everything in their power to steer us on the right way forward. And we as politicians have to make the right decisions for the right reasons as we go forward. We've always done that and we must continue to do that, even though we're in unprecedented times. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Quinn. Uh, I'm going to try again with Kath Fogarty. Are you there, Kath? Yes, I am. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. And apologies to all for that slight problem. Um, thank you for bringing me in. I wanted to add to the concerns raised by the portfolio holder, raised my own concerns around the seriousness and the severity of this situation for us as a council and for the residents in our borough uh, and the absolute uniqueness of this in terms of the scale and size of the problem for us to be left with a funding gap of 25 million pounds in year that we need to solve um, the scale of that and the actions that we would need to take to resolve that um, I, I suppose I can't underestimate the impact that they would have um, the severity of the problem that we face now is the immediacy of the problem and that's probably likened to very much everybody's response in terms of individuals around the COVID response. The medium to longer term position and how that impacts on us is of much greater concern in terms of the impact on future revenues for us as an authority. Funding for the public sector predominantly based around local taxation, the impact on the reset of the forthcoming recession and the impact on the economy as a whole for us to withstand that is going to be really difficult to weather and that will have a direct impact on our residents on our businesses as they fight to survive um, and also on, on how that impacts on the, the balance of funding for us. So the, the position with which that leaves us in terms of an emergency budget we don't take that um, situation lightly and um, we do need to start working on that now but we do eagerly await the fiscal statement promised by the Chancellor early ju July um, what that will reveal in terms of either future emergency funding or changes to the fiscal environment or freedoms will help us plan with some greater certainty. What we do need to, to start on now is looking at what those options are um, for us and once we've got that announcement we'll be in a clearer position about where those plans leave us. Thank you. Thanks Kat. Any further questions or comments from members? OK, are the recommendations on page 94 of the report agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you, everyone. That uh, brings us to the end of today's meeting. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you.